Behind the Leaf discusses cannabis in terms of education, history, culture, policy, and advocacy. It is geared for adults only. If you are not an adult, come back when you are. How you doing? What do you call a man with two joints? Double jointed. What do you call a pig that eats cannabis? You call him a pot belly. Have you ever asked, how does a shark get high? Reefer. Have you ever asked, why couldn't the lifeguard save the hippie? It's because he was far out, bro. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Behind the Leaf. I'm your host, Stephen Contreras, and I just want to say thank you so much. This is season two, episode one. All more cannabis information, all more community, and I'm so thankful for every single one who's viewed, who's subscribed. We couldn't do this without you. So what do we got in store? Season two, we're going to take you all over the city of Long Beach, but let's bring it down to episode one, as we have Miss Zandre Johnson. We're kicking it off with the expungement week. Former gang member, former homeless, turned her life around and is now is changing other people's lives through advocacy. We love to see it here. Then we're at the root of it, we're gonna kick it off and meet Janine Pierce. We're gonna sit down with our councilwoman and find out what cannabis means to her and what she sees of the future of the cannabis industry here in Long Beach. And then we're gonna zoom over to the west side. We're gonna meet up with our OG guys, Optimal Genetics, LBCA members, and we're gonna check their state-of-the-art facility. And last but not least, we're gonna introduce to you some of the newest members of the LBCA, Vinsa Consulting, and find out how Dina and Ian got into the game. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, buckle up your seatbelts, grab your vapes, grab your joints, grab your bongs, grab your dab rigs, eat that edible, don't eat the whole thing, microdose, and join me on this episode of Behind the Leaf. Let's go. My name is Zandre Johnson, and I'm formerly incarcerated and formerly homeless. I have a little bit I want to share with you today because it's important. One of the things I want to um, hype is that my experience goes from 14 to the age of 53 of being homeless. Incarceration, I did life on installment plan, which was 28 years of my life. I didn't stop until 53. The day I lost my mother was the day that I had to change. Um, I lost her to cancer, didn't know she was sick did eight years, eight months, came home, and that was my reality. And through that, I became very angry. Uh, I did some grievings, and then I did some volunteering because I was in a shelter called People Assisting the Homeless. I uh, volunteered at a place called Covenant House, California. I saw that there were a lot of youth there, and I don't know, something in my heart say if I could just save one person, I could save a million. Once I, I got familiar, they asked me if I would start a class. And that class consists of individuals coming into the class and wanting to have conversation like what I'm doing right now. They just want to talk back and forth and, and give their point of view about life. What I found out that a lot of the children that were there were people who had phased out of the system. A lot of their parents were still incarcerated. If not incarcerated, they had passed away. And they wanted to break the cycle, but they didn't know how to break the cycle. But Covenant House gave them the ability to do so. So I was uh, honored to be a part of that. I mean, totally honored. But as time went on, because I did do that, I found myself getting uh, pitched for a Speak Up program in Los Angeles. And I didn't understand what Speak Up was. They said, it's where you tell your lived experience to help others. Well, I didn't really want to tell my story because a lot of people judge you when you tell them where you've been, how you got there, and what you're going through. They put a judgment on you. They pitched me. I went to the class, downtown LA. 
Uh, there was 12 people in the class and they were so honest. They were all telling their stories about addiction. They were telling a story about homelessness, but nobody was touching the base of gang life and incarceration. So I didn't want to be the first to say it. But as I stayed in that class and I had a, a counselor who teaches you how to speak up and speak out, you know, tell you how to put that in the right form, I told that truth to that individual. And that individual said, I think it's time you tell the, the class your story. So once I told the class my story from beginning to end, when I finished, I noticed that I had a sense of relief, but I saw a lot of tears. And those tears were me crying inside, but I hadn't done it, they were doing it for me. And, and I got a phone call to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, when I went to Washington, it was the first time I'd ever been out of the state. But anyway, I spoke um, at a conference. Uh, it was a homeless initiative conference. And after I finished speaking, I just seen all these people standing and clapping. They kept saying, I'm gonna change lives. And at that moment, I decided this is gonna be my passion. I'm gonna love it and treat it like I wake up every day and go to sleep to it. I'm gonna have compassion, I'm gonna have empathy for the life that I used to have. I decided that I wasn't eligible, so I fought for Section 8 housing uh, in a senior building. And it took, it took a while because I had a criminal background and they just didn't wanna help me. But I fought for it and I got it because I found one of those empathetic persons to help me. Going forward, I ended up going to Washington again for another uh, Capitol Hill day. And at that time, I met senators and, and congressmen and women. I felt like they understood what I was saying. I felt like at some point, it was the first time they had ever met somebody like myself, former gang member, former uh, ex-con, uh, formerly homeless, and on top of everything, I was a lesbian. So I don't know if they felt anything like, I don't know, they felt like I was something like their family. They was treating me like I was their family. They was talking to me and hugging me and telling me little stories about their own life. And some was even said that they had a bout with fear of being homeless in their positions. And I'm like, really? You know, so I felt a camaraderie there. Like, okay, well, I, I'm not in a strange environment. I'm, I, I'm really here to, Put out the message and I need you all to bring the message out. And so I worked with Diane Feinstein, I worked with uh, Ryball, I worked with of course Mark Wrigley Thomas, he had an office there, and there's so many other senators, I can't name them all right now. Each one of them gave me another sense to go further. For me to get housing, I had been incarcerated, so they said no. So we fought for that that you can't say no to an incarcerated, uh, uh, a formerly incarcerated person because they need to have a second chance. They've already did their time. So we felt like the, the people that, a lot of the people that were out there were mayor play, uh, major players of tickets, county time, jail time for marijuana use, uh, any type of drug use, they was there for that. And that's why they didn't get housing. So we had to put something, we had to get uh, this woman named Sheila uh, uh, Rappaport to author a law to take to the floor in Sacramento. This year, I was asked about doing an expungement clinic uh, with social impact. I saw where now people can not only get housing, they can get a job, you know, because this, this uh, ticket for marijuana that's legal is still on a record. Like they didn't ever clear that up. There was nothing to clear it up, you know? And I'm figuring like after expungement week and those that get it expunged, they'll have a better opportunity at getting jobs and housing because it's something that was way back there. It got legalized, but that part never got straightened out. So I'm real enthused about that because I know the many people that it would feed. And I'm also hoping that we continue this as long as we can continue it because Come to find out there's a whole lot of people with small tickets that's holding them back from good jobs, you know, and housing. I, I really know that for a fact, you know. I'm grateful for what has taken place in our cities today because we didn't have it back in back then, you know, from gang toosing to, you know, to expungement clinics 
to Prop 47, to Prop 64, to Measure J that they're putting on the ballot, to all these different things they just didn't have because they weren't hearing enough why they should have it. And I'm, I'm very uh, proud of myself on a humble proud that I was instrumental on saying something got to change. I don't care. I want to do the work because um, the work has to be done. Too many people sit back and think about what should change, but won't go to the riverbank to make that change. And what I mean by that, travel those riverbanks, you know, with LASA, just suggesting that people come off the river bank and get housing, you know, and that's not a one-time thing. You have to do it consistently because people's minds don't get changed instantly, especially when they're used to being free. And now you're talking about, even though it's a key and a, a kitchen and a bedroom and a bathroom and all the luxuries of an apartment, you're talking about taking them away from the freedom that they have that nobody tells them when to come and what to do. You know, so you have to restructure their way of thinking what is best for their health, what is best for their life, everything. You know, the possibilities of longevity comes within a safe place to call home. So what happens is that number that's on the flyer, they contact they leave a message with their name, and then it generates into an in, uh, uh, email that's an intake for us that call. We get that list, we call the individuals verbatim, and we just go down the list and we get their birthday, and we ask them a couple of you know questions that need to be asked, because some people get a ticket in their own name, and now they didn't got married, even young. You know what I'm saying? So we have to know the name that whatever they got is in that name. And then we, I get an email address. Once that list is finished, then it goes to another phase of it, which is to the public defender's office. The public defender at that time, he or she, and it's seven of them, are to go down that list and check everybody's qualifications. If they're qualified, they will contact back on that intake and they will say that person needs an appointment date and then we give them an appointment date to come in. So to say it should be more, I wish we could run that clinic 24 hours, but because we're getting free help from the public defenders, everything is time scale, you know, and they're gonna be active in that expungement clinic via, you know, Zoom. And people feel special when they're the ones that's uh, there waiting to go to that table to sit down they feel special and I'm so glad marijuana is legal because that was just crazy to just lock people up for a joint come on now really you know the bag wasn't even big enough to put a dime in and you just send somebody away and if it was a three strike I was sitting in there with people doing 25 to life 25 to life on a ten dollar bag because it was illegal and they was fighting their way out of it. You know, who does that? T took a, one lady was there for taking a, a pack of T-shirts from a 99 cent store. It was a third strike, you know? They came over with the RICO Act. Oh, just to pin us down, you know? But yet, the privilege get to do what we did and never get in any trouble. I don't get that. This law gotta be for everybody. So when Again, when expungement happens in our neighborhood, I'm so happy to let them know that we is just as equal as the privilege. We deserve the same great life as they deserve. That's where I'm at with that. First of all, I don't get the opportunity to be expunged, not on this level. So I'm not doing it for me. It's not for me, like I'm the only there because I want to sign up and have it done. No, it's not coming my way. I'm doing it because I know it's gonna help somebody live better. And that's what this is all about, a quality of life, you know? Just living better. Uh, when you fill out that and they ask that question, have you ever been convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor? They even put misdemeanor down there. And you gotta be honest. Because if you're not honest and they find out, guess what, you lose it, right? So you gotta be honest. So you imagine how many people sit down filling out a job application, sweating. You know what I'm saying? So when, you, when, when I think about it, I feel like 
Whoever gets done out of the seven hubs, when they walk away from that, they gonna feel so damn good. Just to know, you know, that shit, I ain't got to deal with this no more. I can really put this behind me, you know? You can reach out for the expungement on social impact. You can get it on Twitter. We have the radio station that's bringing it out. My good friend, you know, Roland Bynum said, you know, bring it to uh, a 102.3, and she's uh, confirmed that she will announce it, you know. That's how they can contact me. Or they can come to the hubs and see me in person, you know, and let me give them a hug for making that first step to recovery, you know. Because that's what it is to me. Not saying not smoking, go, go for it. That's why we legalize it. There's nothing wrong with natural. This is natural. There's something wrong with me shaking up some stuff because that's a whole bunch of chemicals going down. You know what I'm saying? But it ain't nothing wrong with natural. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of At the Root of It. I am your host, Stephen Contreras, Community Outreach for the OBCA, and I am here with Councilwoman Janine Pierce. How are you doing today? Thank you for taking time to, uh, you know, join me. Absolutely. I'm doing pretty good today. Life is good, you know? That's that's what? all we can say. You know, another day, another blessing. Um, it is a little warm, but we're going to get through it. It's a little toasty. It's really hot. <laughs> yeah, it's toasty. Before we get into it, tell everyone a little bit about yourself or what was your journey like getting into uh, local government? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Councilmember Pierce uh, represent uh, the downtown area and a little bit of East Long Beach and just up next to Central Long Beach in downtown LB. I've uh, been in office for four years and I've always kind of been uh, a rebel rouser, as I say. I've always been someone that has taken to the streets for justice and equality and tried to work on social justice policies. So when the opportunity came available to run for an open seat, uh, the district actually has uh, about a seven year life expectancy difference in between Ocean Boulevard and 10th Street, which are both in my district. So it's uh, definitely an area that we need to focus on closing some of the equity gaps that we have in the city. And that's why I ran, and it's been a fun time. I know you're very active, and uh, you're actually a supporter of cannabis. And so I've, I've, I've loved working alongside of you. But speaking about local government, why, and with the elections coming up, why is it important to vote during local elections? So you have to vote in local elections, one, to make sure that you get people that will represent your interests, but also so that you can build power, right? Like we have this democracy that says that you have an opportunity to go to the ballot box, uh, every two to four years and vote for people to represent you. What happens, unfortunately, is that a lot of times people that represent big areas like the entire city or an assembly district, they will look at where people vote and they'll say, well, this part of the community votes in higher numbers than this part of the community. Therefore, their issues are more important, right? Like the, the checks and balances aren't just, oh, we all vote, but people really do look and say, this area of town has a 70% turnout. And so if they, like right now we're talking about defunding the police, right? And reallocating police funds. So if people that live in the high voting areas say we don't want that, then it makes it harder for those that represent low voting areas to say, no, my constituents and my voters support it. Yeah. So one is just making sure you have your voice heard, but really every step along the way, not just during election cycles, your vote comes up and it's counted. Uh, on every issue that your local electeds might be taking up. Thank you, thank you for breaking that down. We also have the 2020 census going on right now. Um, can you touch on the importance of, of being counted? Yeah, uh, one is we want everybody to be counted. Uh, the way that the census works is it's every 10 years and they do a couple of things with it. They allocate uh, resources like dollars for healthcare, for climate, for roads, for transportation based on the population. Uh, they also will redraw district lines based on where uh, the population is at. And so if you're not counted, then you're gonna miss out on resources. Uh, again, the ones I just laid out, but also schools. Uh, there's also a lot of people that don't get counted uh, because they live in fear, right? And right now uh, with the state of our federal uh, situation with the man that calls himself our president, 
he has tried to instill a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, he has closed the time frame for, uh, in order to fill out your census form. And so it's ever more important that if you're somebody that hears the word census, that you know that that's not only responsibility for you and your family, but for your neighborhood and for people that you don't know, uh, this is really the, uh, the time that we can advocate and ensure that that five or 10 minutes it takes you to complete it has an outcome that's gonna benefit your life for the next 10 years. Yeah, so it's very important to help for, for both ways to work, you know, hand in hand. And speaking of that, going back into a little bit about cannabis, um, what is the importance of a relationship for a local government and the community when it comes to the cannabis industry and advocacy? Yeah, well, you know, when I ran in 2016, uh, LBCA was advocating for local cannabis policy uh, to regulate um, adult medical use and adult use at the state level. And it was interesting because I was one of the only candidates uh, that was running in my area that said that I supported it. And we got some pressure on that. But the reason, one, I support it because of my life experience. But two, is that we know that if we're not regulating and if we're not in tune with what the industry needs, that people will go to the black market or the unregulated market, if you will. And we know that in that area, that we have cannabis products that might not be tested, that might have chemicals that could do more damage than good. Uh, we also know that whenever we're regulating an industry and we're building a partnership, we're building community with that. And so I was excited to be in office whenever all the shops that are now open were opening because we had neighborhoods that had some fear, right? We had neighborhoods that said like, I don't want a cannabis shop in my neighborhood. You have a bunch of whoever's hanging out outside. And we said, no, we've got a point person in each shop a uh, community liaison person that can work with you, that can make sure that we're cleaning up our neighborhoods and being safe. And I think that's where LBCA and the shops have really stepped up is, I mean, you guys roll deep whenever it's not uh, COVID time. You show up, you clean neighborhoods, you've done uh, our Thanksgiving giveaways with us and you've really integrated yourself as part of the community. And so for electeds that might not have fully supported it or embraced it in 2016 or before that, I think you see them partnering with the cannabis industry a lot more. That builds trust in community and it means that when we regulate, we can look at things like the tax levels, right? And we can say, okay, we need to reduce tax in manufacturing because we understand the way that the business is operating because we have a working relationship with that industry uh, versus where it was 10 years ago is we didn't have those relationships, therefore it must not be good. I agree. And I'd say right now that cannabis is probably one of the most transparent industries. And I'd say yeah. that at least with um, with our LBCA members, we like to be very transparent with our local government. And we love this partnership that we have created. Where do you see cannabis evolving into? Well, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities, particularly in the city of Long Beach. Um, you know, we've got retail, we've got a certain number of them. I think there's conversations about how to make sure that we're professionalizing the industry. You guys have done a great job of uh, having the LVCC uh, open up some training programs there. But we know that there are areas in the in the world that have really opened it up more and have allowed for what we call entertainment licenses. So whether you could have on-site consumption, uh, food is also, you know, an, an in interesting area, not just packaged food, but, yeah. you know, uh, I love cooking. It's one of my favorite things in the whole world. And I remember uh, in my younger days, we made salsa and i remember like this is the best tasting not because it was cannabis yeah. not because of the effects of cannabis but because there's actual really great flavors that you could put into a dish that elevates the taste and so i think that it's everything from entertaining open spaces to making sure that we have a culinary uh community and i think that there's opportunities to have open shared cooking spaces where businesses and entrepreneurs can come in with literally nothing, hopefully, and then be able to build up their business. So I think that that hopefully is the future and hopefully uh, the city will work to make sure that we're being a, a yes partner instead of a no partner, you know? Well, th thank you so much for, for that. I really do see that as the future as well. And that's something that we, we hope and it's only with time and, you know, COVID is getting in the way, but it's okay. It's uh. There's a little other things that are break year. More we all needed kind of a break year, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we can all use one, that's for sure. <laughs> this has been an amazing time uh, getting to know you a little bit more. Is there anything that you would like to leave off on? 
or any last words you would like to say? I, I think people should be hopeful, not only about cannabis, but about any effort that they're trying to organize around. Um, if you would have told me four years ago that the LBCA would not only be thriving with open shops, but that we would be having other conversations uh, about possibly the culinary world or on-site consumption, I would have said no way. You know, and I think it really goes to show that when you build trust and you're transparent and you build relationships that uh, great things can, can happen. So, yeah, thanks for having me. No, thank you so much for your time. Um, if anyone wants to get a hold of you or get in contact, where can they reach you? Out of here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can find my information on the city's website. I'm the second district. Um, Janine, J-E-A-N-N-I-N-E, last name Pierce, P-E-A-R-C-E. So Janine.Pierce at longbeach.gov or district two. Well, thank you so much, Councilwoman. It was an honor to get to know you. Thank you so much for partnering with the cannabis industry and being an advocate. And thank you for everything that you do. As for everyone else, have a wonderful day and we'll see you on the next episode of At The Root Of It. Thanks, man, take care. All right, well, uh, I'm Marty. What's your title? Oh. <laughs> okay, take two. Jesus. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> What's up, MTV? Welcome to my crib. This is Optimal Genetics Headquarters. Let's come on in. I'm Marty, the CEO and one of the co-founders of Optimal Genetics. I'm Gabriel the CSO, Chief Science Officer of Optimal Genetics. And I am Tyler. I do marketing and sales for Optimal Genetics and I'm also a co-founder. So uh, Optimal Genetics was founded in 2016 and you know back then it was uh, really the, the Prop 215 days and uh, access to clean medicine wasn't as readily available. And so at the time, my mom, who has an autoimmune disease, she was looking to try cannabis just to see if it could help some of her symptoms. And I really didn't feel comfortable sending her into a dispensary, just not knowing the consistency of what the brands provided there. So that's when we first started looking uh, to source our own oil, um, you know, to of course get it lab tested. You know, back then there was many, a lot fewer places to get tested than there are now. Um, but yeah, I just started as, as, as wanting to start a company that, um, you know, would, we'd be comfortable uh, sending our friends and family to, and of course, uh, a company that when we go to a dispensary, you know, something that we would look for as well, you know, clean, potent, consistent medicine at a reasonable price. Yeah, we wouldn't make it if we wouldn't smoke it ourselves. Exactly. And of course, you know, many of us have beginnings uh, far before, you know, 2016. Uh, I myself, you know, first started growing in 2013 just out of a, a little small wooden armoire in my garage. It had room for maybe like two plants. I think that's, you know, the case for, for many of us. Uh, you know, Gabe, I know, had uh, some humble beginnings as well, mm -hmm. doing things that we definitely wouldn't do nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, gotta but, start somewhere though. Yeah. Yeah, of course. We, we all definitely started from... The 215 days, uh, myself extracting for well over a decade now, um, definitely open blasting. Um, I perfected it to a T though. Like if once I, once I talked to some of the people that are in, in the industry, such as Nate, like uh, we had it behind the, was it behind the hem? And in that episode we talked about like our humble beginnings in extraction and uh, you know, botanical sciences. But yeah, I like that. What about you, Tyler? Uh, I started honestly. My cousin managed a dispensary in 2014, and I was working at a local warehouse at the time. And I said, "Why not? I'll try it out." You know, and I ended up loving it, and ended up moving into uh, the smoke shop scene and doing some distribution there, meeting a lot of people in the industry uh, as far as you know the selling point goes. And I was doing. Uh, a lot of events like the Cannabis Cup and Chalice and things like that. Marty actually helped a couple times with the, the cannabis events, but you know, when I met Marty, he we still have the same mentality and kind of the same goal, and we decided that we wanted to start something that we could build to what our standards would be, and Optimal Genetics was born, and 
I mean, I, I think the name kind of speaks for itself when people are looking for something that is proper and people are looking for something that is going to give them the effects that they're looking for, we come in and we are that optimal product and um, no matter what we make, we strive to be able to do that and that was kind of what what brought me on and what continued, what we, why we continue to do what we want to do. And yeah, just to be as transparent as possible throughout the whole, you know, cycle, you know, through the, the people that we get our, our material from, through the distribution channels, to the retail side, and of course, where it ends up with the clients. I mean, we just want to be as transparent as possible with test results. Um, you know, back when we first started, uh, pesticides used to be a, a lot bigger deal, you know, pretty much any kind of oil you found, whether it was CO2, distillate, even shatters, waxes, you never knew if it was clean. Of course, Eagle as regulations, uh, oh, Eagle 20, my glubionol, yeah. as, as regulations have progressed, you know, that's obviously a standard now for, for regulated companies, but, you know, that's, that was our, our goal at the time, was to just be as transparent as possible with the, the material that we were getting and providing to that, that end customer. Mm -hmm. And Tyler also mentioned, of course, the word optimal. Uh, optimal genetics. Uh, I think some people sometimes get confused by the name. Uh, some people ask if we're uh, a, genetics you know, company. a genetics company, a breeding company, a seed company, a clone company. Um, you know, our, our goal from the get-go was to form a vertically integrated company that covered uh, all bases of the, the manufacturing cycle, from cultivation through uh, you know, distribution, of course, to manufacturing, and eventually to the retail side as well. Uh, we are uh, self-funded, we're bootstrapping, so we definitely started with what we thought would be the most viable entry point into uh, the cannabis industry, which we thought was manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, but just for those wondering, we are, we will get there eventually, we, we will do our own genetics and, and, and things like that, but for now we're just using the most optimal, gen optimal genetics we can find in order to make our, our products. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, even to touch on what Tyler was saying, that, you know, they, they were at Chalice, they were at uh, Cow Palace, all these events. And it's funny to see that we've been so close to each other, but we never actually crossed paths. Even at MJ BizCon, every single event, I was always everywhere. These guys were always everywhere. And just so happens to be that, you know, Tyler sends me a message, hey, I want you to try our product. Having Tyler say, try this cart, you know, I gave it a shot. I'm like, yeah, sure, let's let's hang out, let's do this. I try it. It was an impeccable product. It was something that I could see myself putting my name behind, my life behind. And you know, hung out with Marty, hung out with Alex, who's our uh, COO, and it just clicked. You know, we we all have the same mentality of providing a clean, quality product. You know, doing something that I could send my family towards to consume. You know. And yeah, that's, that's how I jumped in. Just to touch base on what Gabe said actually, we are always constantly doing R&D. We may think that we have a perfect product, but just like Gabe said, you know, that was a product, the product that he tried was something that was from a year ago. You know, every month we're doing new things, we're, we're trying new ways of perfecting our product, so that way we do provide the most optimal experience. And I think that's what Gabe picked up on, you know, he saw us and he saw, wow, these guys are willing to do what it takes to be able to provide a proper product. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, Gabe was, he was the only and the best addition that we could have made to the team. And uh, we're just excited to get this, get this going, really. Ooh, it's been a long time. Uh, obviously, one date that I always keep in mind is when we actually submitted our application to the city of Long Beach. That was, uh, I believe, September 28th, 2018. Uh, it took a few months to get the application through and get everything, uh, you know, approved and ready and kind of corrections that we needed. Uh, I think we, it was in November, I believe, of 2018 that our application was accepted. Uh, it took quite a while to get all of our plans through. Uh, when I say that we bootstrapped this, we really have done everything from, you know, going down to City Hall with the plans, talking to all the different plan checkers, the, the seven different apartments that you have to go through. It took us about six and a half months to get our plans approved and we finally started construction in July of 2019. We thought we'd be done with construction in two to three months, but as I'm sure uh, any industry operator can tell you that many things come up during that, that time, whether it's new requirements from the city, just any kind of things that, unplanned uh, things that come up, but we ended up finishing construction in 
uh, technically February of 2020 of this year. And then uh, since then, we've just been, of course, ordering equipment. Um, we did have an unfortunate break-in that happened in, in November of uh, 2019. It was the day before Thanksgiving, where we did have quite a few items of our uh, extraction equipment that was stolen. So we kind of had to go through a whole process of reordering, restructuring, rebuilding yes. again from from already a bootstrap position. After we had to reorder some of the equipment, of course, the lead times uh, were, were fairly long for a lot of the stuff. Uh, but at this point, we're just going through our final inspections. Hope to be up and running uh, sometime in August. But you know, as 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 I've learned throughout this process, there's probably going to be something else that comes up as well. So. But we'll, the, we'll see. Right the idea was, you know, the idea, the seed of the idea, if you will, was planted in 2016. Developing this company, acquiring the knowledge of in and outs politically, uh, legally, uh, you know, politically coming, you know, especially from the LBCA side, one of the huge reasons why we're part of the LBCA, you know, is to be able to gain knowledge and access to things that we didn't know, you know. Building this company was, it took different processes, one of them being collecting as many people as we can, getting ideas, getting information, and then growing, if you will, from there. So, um, it, I mean, it's been, you know, it's now 2020. We say we were established in 2016, but really, you know, the, the turning point was the application and really starting R&D and continuing R&D on our product. I think that anyone on, you know, when someone expects to hit our cartridge, I think that a lot of people expect what they normally expect, you know? Oh yeah, like this is whatever, you know, it tastes okay. Probably will take a couple hits to get, you know, where they need to be. Um, I feel like our product stands alone in the first hit, you know, it's right when you, when you administer the medication to your body, you instantly feel something. And it doesn't require multiple um, applications of this medication, if you will. You know, it's one hit, you're able to do what you need to do and, um, that's kind of what we focus on is consistency, potency, transparency, you know, being transparent not only with each other, but with our consumers, you know, being able to provide the most quality product means that you have to have extreme transparency, test results, um, return policies, customer service, things like that. Um, I feel like, you know, we are, because we are such a tight knit company, we are so small that we're able to, um, kind of fine tune and be able to um, accept what people have to say, change and be how, you know be better if we can, but also um, adhere to those customers and patients that have questions, you know, that have, um, you know, that are used to smoking something different and getting different effects. You know, I think we're able to answer questions and be on point with what we say to people and how we say it. And I think that goes with our medication as well. To go back to what you said, uh, what do people expect? You know, across, there are many different cartridge brands. Um, everyone is using a similar base product. You know, obviously everyone's using uh, some kind of distillate. Uh, but one area that we've uh, continued to do research and development on and uh, try to improve is our flavor profiles. So we originally used, uh, you know, when we first started, we used just uh, a brand of terpene that we found, you know, we had met them at MJ BizCon, thought they were great. As we went on, we found out that there's a, uh, actually a member of the LBCA, Abstracts, who produces a, a very high quality line of terpenes. Found out that their terpenes were just in general, the flavor profiles were more on point, uh, they were just more flavorful in general. So, as Tyler has said, we've been able to uh, kind of switch directions there and create a, what we feel is a better product with another member of our own community. And that's really what it comes down to for us as well, uh, aside from you know, providing that safe product for family, friends, for the market, is supporting those in our community. And mm -hmm. you know, we've chosen Long Beach, uh, the beautiful city of Long Beach, as our home. And you know, none of us actually live in Long Beach now. We'd like to, with the commute's rather far right now. <laughs> um, but we saw that Long Beach's cannabis program was one that we felt we could grow in. Uh, it seemed like they had a, uh, a good setup, a, a good foothold for people in the community. And you know, it's not a perfect program, but it, fe it feels like they're moving in that, that right direction. So, you might all have the same. <laughs> <one. Yeah. laughs> Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. Well, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> Abstracts, one of the first 
you know, we, well, when you look through their website, there's a bunch of different strains. Yeah. It's kind of overwhelming, but one that they showed us uh, that was kind of R&D was something called Blue Milk. And this comes from apparently the Star Wars universe. I'm not too versed, but uh, there, there's a drink called Blue Milk. And they were able to do uh, some flavor profiling on, on, on that same type of uh, substance. And it's just this wonderful kind of fruity, fruity, deliciousness, smooth, <laughs> creamy, it's, awesome. It's, it's really hard to perfect. describe. It, it's, it's, it's not a flavor that uh, I've ever really experienced before. But yeah, when people, I think when you'd, you'd ask most people what optimal genetics flavor is, is their favorite, they'd probably say Blue Milk. Yeah. Soon they'll be saying GMO though. We have, we have our own formulation that we're working on with Abstracts, exclusive for Optimal Genetics. We'll be making more exclusive flavors with Abstracts. And, you know, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we'll be doing uh, some, some fun stuff with them. We did get second place at the Secret Sesh with our Tropicana cookies yep. that they formulated for us. So, we have that under our belts. Definitely GMO will be an up and coming though. For sure. I would say that GMO is probably my uh, my backup batter. You know what I mean? I'm waiting for R and D to be completed mm -hmm. on on the GMO. Right now, the blue milk is blue milk or Tropicana cookies is probably my my top. But uh, uh, we were lucky enough to be connected with um, a local Long Beach cultivator um, who were trying to get to the LBCA, mm -hmm. um, but they were um, they blessed us with an opportunity to be able to fine tune this GMO product and turn it from flower form into cartridge form essentially um, without actually running the live resin and actually running the plant. So shout out to that cultivator and Abstract for being yep. able to let us R&D the GMO, which I feel Thank like is gonna be a hitter. Thank you, Jack, you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, LBCA? So, we're here in the preparation room for Optimal Genetics. Uh, here I have some of my auxiliary components. My solvent cabinet storages, I have two for ethanol, one for hexane. I'll be doing some cannabinoid conversions and some chromatography with that. Uh, I got my air compressor over here so I can work my Viton pump, my PLC for my centrifuge. Uh, I've got my oil heater for my decarboxylation unit so that you know, I can make my proper conversions, activate all that THC acid into actual THC. Um, my secure storage room number two, this room will be full of beautiful material, hopefully from Wonder Brett, you guys out there. I've, I know I've talked to you guys, so hopefully I get to make some awesome stuff with that. Um, but yeah, so I'll be taking you to the lab next. So here we are in the actual lab now. Um, this is a flex mod. Here I have some of my equipment that I'll be making my distillate and all the products for Optimal Genetics. Uh, you know, your basic 50 liter rotor evaporator over here. Uh, I got my, my chiller powering the, the roto. Right behind me I have my de decarboxylation unit like I was saying. You need to be able to convert all that acid into actual THC. Uh, over here I have my short path distillation unit. So this is actually gonna be separating all the compounds that I actually want. So separating terpenes, cannabinoids, and residual cannabinoids, and giving you the optimal product, which I'll be making with this bad boy. Uh, let me take you to now my class one, division one, explosion proof room. Here's where the fun begins. So here I have my, my heat exchanger, that was loud. Uh, I have my heat exchanger right here, so this chills my ethanol to negative 40 Celsius in less than 30 minutes. Uh, that cycles through one of my solvent storages. Uh, from here, I'll be having material packed and ready to go in my centrifuge, washing that, extracting everything, uh, removing all solvent up to a 99.9% .9 level. So all I'll be having to devolatize is 0 0.01, which is really, really, really efficient. Here I have my roughing filter. So every single time I'll be running, you wanna be able to remove some of those heavy particles as in plant matter. So this will be removing all my plant matter over there. Uh, moving on, once I actually have a saturated solvent, I have a filtration unit. If any, if any of you guys are familiar with uh, water membrane filtration, you'll know what this is. Also, polypropylene, guys, chemical resistant. It's not plastic, come on now. 
Go from there, my clean uh, solvent storage unit. So once everything's been uh, filtered out, all my fats and lipids, uh, doing color remediation, everything's completed, that gets stored right here so they can start warming and I can start taking it to my roto. So this is the lab. If, if you guys want to learn more about extraction, and if you're serious about being in the cannabis industry, the LBCA is collaborating with the Long Beach City College. And we're having a class, an eight-week class, on every single aspect of the industry. So talking history, talking growing, talking um, lab testing, um, the dispensaries, uh, distribution, metric, and of course, extraction. I'll be your teacher for extraction, so please, if you guys want to join, that would be awesome. I look forward to teaching you guys. This will be fun. Um, as far as social media goes, we're just at Optimal Genetics on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, our website is optimalgeneticsinc.com. And uh, yeah, if you end up DMing the page, you'll be talking to this fine gentleman right here. Questions, and... concerns, comments, yeah. anything, shoot us a DM. Like I said before, we're always open to uh, concerns and opinions and things like that. We want to be able to provide to as many people as we can. And another reason why we are so excited to be part of the LBCA is, uh, as I've said, the community, um, you know, we know once we get up and running, we'll be able to approach these members who have known us for months now as we've you know, travel along this journey together, and you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to get in uh, and get shelf space just because they know us. We obviously, you know, think we have a great product, but just that community element, um, just being able to support other Long Beach uh, processors and, and and retailers, I feel like that's uh, just you know, obvious and obvious in for us. So, shout out to all those amazing LBCA distributors and retailers that we'll be uh, talking to even more very soon. Yeah, exactly. Hi, I'm Ian. And I'm Gina. And we're Vincent Consulting. Uh, we've been around for about six months now, but we've been uh, working together in cannabis for over two years. Uh, Vinsa Consulting is basically the product of both Dina and my own um, professional experiences and uh, ambitions. We um, we met two years ago in at the California Cannabis Awards, and definitely had the same vision. And it was love at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> we started by by building distribution uh, companies and businesses together. And usually she talks more. <laughs> I don't have to carry it. You know? <laughs> I just punch in for that, you know, you know, <laughs> little extra, you know. And all of a sudden, I'm having him do it. <laughs> so we definitely complement each other. I mean, Dina's very much been sales and relationships. She has a, a very deep history with that. And then I am on the the legal side. I'm actually a tax and transactional attorney and been operating cannabis businesses directly for over three years. Yeah, and definitely experienced uh, doing sales and building sales teams in cannabis. So like Ian said, not only have we built distributions, but I've um, taken over 40 brands to the market. Brass Knuckles was one of the biggest brands in 2016. I did 30 million for them, retail rollout in Northern California. Other brands were LA Kush, Lemon Tree, Golden State Banana. Ian and I worked on a few big brands like THC Design, Summit Boys, Currently, now we are servicing field extracts, um, as well as Uncle Arnie's and Nectar, and also Dreamt, um, some of the, and Zofo. And so those are the, so the biggest brands right now in the market. I was an MRI technician for six years, and I decided that I no longer wanted to work a nine to five job. So I went on Craigslist, and I found an ad and this ad was for a sales position for a cannabis company. I thought it was definitely a scam, but I ended up emailing the 
company and they reached back out to me. My interview was at Taco Bell and they gave me a bag of weed and told me, go on Weed Maps and figure it out. And I said, no way. And they're like, you're hired. And so it was really nice. They bought me a seven layer chalupa, <laughs> a seven layer burrito, excuse me, and a chalupa. And I was really excited about that. And I was like, dude, this is for real. <laughs> but that's actually how I got into the industry. I ended up teaching myself. I went on Weed Maps and I got into about 130, you know, back in the day, black market shops uh, for a edible company in Orange County. And I ended up doing a demo in LA and it was right next to Brass Knuckles. They were only about a week old and they offered me a job there. And that's how, I mean, it was just, that's, that's my story. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually did smoke for, when I was 18 and that was the first time I actually tried uh, cannabis and then I stopped because I was getting drug tested. So then I ended up smoking back when I had that Taco Bell <laughs> story. <laughs> um, I actually, I got into cannabis when I was in law school, and it was a way for me to, to manage the stress and anxiety of that, you know, joy ride. <laughs> uh, our mission is to be the, the best sales and logistics partner. And really what we do is we are supply chain management for brands in cannabis. So when a brand that's going to market in Southern California needs to take care of sales, account management, distribution, collections. We handle all of that turnkey and we're experienced in each of those. Well, it means that our expertise and our background is in driving and developing sales specifically at the retail level in cannabis. So Dina's experience has mostly been in developing and cultivating and leveraging retail relationships that she's developed over the years throughout California. So right now we're actually averaging about 10 new dispensaries a week. We, like, like Ian said, um, we've been only operating, you know, for, for sh short few months, but two months in, um, in the SoCal market, we've landed about 75 retail lo locations. Yeah, that's right. I think Dina brings up a, a good point is that we've actually, we're actually just piloting this new model um, right now and we've, We've only begun uh, operating this way since, what was it? May. June, May? Yeah. May 1st. Yeah, May 1st. And we're now in about 75 locations. Yeah, retail locations. Yeah, the response has been overwhelmingly positive with all of our brands. They really like that basically we get to develop and cultivate a personalized relationship with the brands and the retailers. and handle all the logistics and the kind of the back end supply chain headaches for them and just make sure that they're presented across the board and in, in the way that is right for their brand. I mean, uh, there's a lot that's rewarding about what we do. Um, I really feel like for me, um, I feel like it would be sales. I, I feel like that that's really what we're, we're great at, we're passionate about and. Man, there's a lot. Um, it's really awesome to, to see, you know, like Dina said, the placement, to see that impact, to see, you know, brands getting into retail, to see the product turning over, to see users using and enjoying it, to see, you know, the whole life cycle there of just, you know, introducing something new to uh, 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 not just a retailer, but to a community. Um, so that's a lot of fun and it's rewarding. Um, Definitely, and then building the relationships on the back end. We work with some amazing companies, um, not only our vendors, but you know the distributors and suppliers that we work with um, are all fantastic, and they're all relationships that you know we've had to to earn, and and frankly, that earning the, their trust and earning their business and earning you know their respect to where you know we can tell them look we think you should probably maybe reallocate your production towards these products because this is what um, you know our data is suggesting um, and to be able to see those things turn into success for, for everyone in the supply chain that's definitely rewarding. I was gonna say like we, we look for you know we're, we are a startup company a family-owned company and we look for brands that um, really want to start from the bottom and go to the top so 
You know, we don't look for brands that are, you know, success well, of course, successful that, you know, for example, like 710 or heavy hitters, we look for brands that need help and that need traction to a dispensary. Yeah, absolutely. That's been our forte is really, um, is growing yeah. a brand's presence. That's really so, what we're known for, growing a brand. <laughs> it's a tough process. <laughs> yeah, we have both a quantitative and a qualitative approach. And the quantitative is as far as what's, is the pricing competitive? Uh, is the brand spending the, expending the appropriate resources in marketing? marketing. Um, and you know what their production and their own projections look like mm -hmm. and then the the qualitative is more subjective and so our menu that we work on the agency side is a non-competitive portfolio of brands where they each have a unique value proposition and positioning so we don't take brands that are in direct yeah, conflict with, the, with yeah. the, each other um, <laughs> oh. Definitely, we'd have to say, I mean, I would say Uncle Arnie's is definitely our ideal client right now, because <laughs> it's a perfect- It's an ex a perfect it's example. A, yeah, it's a perfect example. It's, you know, it's a summer beverage um, that's doing great right now. Yeah, they and hit on basically across the board. They have uh, solid packaging and presentation, uh, good pricing, very competitive pricing, and uh, great marketing strategy and execution. I reached out to, like, I kind of reached out to Ian and told him that I wanted to be involved more in the cannabis industry uh, and especially the LBCA, seeing what you have done in the industry, you know, getting everybody involved in Long Beach and, and you know, Long Beach is our, one of our, you know, one of our territories that we do service in California. So I told Ian. And our neighbors, you know, yeah, we're just, we're, we're right around the corner. Yeah, so really, I'm, why we joined LBC was to um, be a part of the family and be involved um, in, in the industry and be able to, you know, be there for, you know, be there for anything that you guys do need as a consulting agency, you know? Oh yeah, we definitely are dabbers. Oh man. We're dabbers. Yeah. I don't think we can live without a dab. <laughs> Shout out to Guild <laughs> for making really good concentrates. The D8 shades. Diamond the Sauce. Diamond sauce. D8 Diamond yeah, Sauce, that'd be Delta my choice. Yeah, the D8 Diamond Sauce is amazing. <laughs> Just dab all day and all night. <laughs> really building the, the free distributions in the legal market was definitely a huge success. Um, that's really where we've, I mean, we've built that track record and, you know, now these brands that we're servicing today, I feel like, have seen what we've built and trust us. Um. Well, I, I also think, I think that another thing that, that Dina says <laughs> is that, you know, if you haven't been burned, oh, yeah. then, you're you know. You're doing it wrong. You're, yeah, then you're doing <laughs> it wrong. Well, basically, the kind of, you know, rite of passage in the cannabis industry is, is to be on the bad side of a, a deal gone wrong. Yeah. Um, and the amount of learning experience and kind of uh, maturation that go that comes with that that, mm -hmm. that comes not only with experiencing it but then you know deciding to continue on you know despite of it or um, yeah. is is really i think what separates people that that do well in the cannabis industry from those that kind of flame out is you know the people that flame out they one one stumbling block turns into another uh, and you know they just can't get out of their own way. I think sales uh, is a major one. Yeah. As I think Logistics the whole supply chain yeah. is is not doing well in cannabis, specifically in California. Um, the the forced turnover to distributors has been disastrous, and uh, I think you know it's going to continue to be a pain point um, until you know for a few years. Um, and, and that's why we're working at making that part of the supply chain a better experience and a more professional experience, um, all the way from sales to collections. Because that's, it's frankly, you know, sales, for a lot of brands, sales is a problem. For a lot of brands, collections is a problem. They'll, they'll get the sales out there, they'll get the placement, but they'll then never the they'll never get the money from it. So like, yeah. what's the point? <laughs> We're on all social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, at vinsa.consulting. And then I'm on Instagram at 
IS Daily, and then we've got at bluntly.dina. Reach out to us uh, at team at vinsa.group. What's up, guys? This is your main homie, Eddie F. Diaz, here along with the LBCA to bring you guys another high history. Let's get started. Most medical patients may be not familiar with this next high history inductee. Mr. Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy. He's an Irishman who introduced cannabis to the Western medicine. Not only is he a pioneer in cannabis therapy, but he has also invented modern treatment for cholera, laid the first telegraph system in Asia, and made significant contributions to pharmacology, chemistry, drug science, drug clinical trials, science education, and even underwater engineering. He was more productive in his lifetime than some inventors combined. So let's see how Dr. O'Shaughnessy effectively changed the world. The University of Edinburgh saw that he was a remarkably intelligent person and admitted him into their university before he was even 18, just to show how intelligent this guy was. He studied chemistry, medicine, autonomy, take that back, anatomy, and forensic technology. So in 1831, there was a cholera outbreak and he actually tested the blood of people who were infected. Even though it didn't get its name for another 60 years, he was able to identify a treatment that helped save many, many lives. Most doctors who used his theory actually saved up half of their patients from dying. O'Shaughnessy actually spent part of his life in India understanding that cannabis was used both recreationally and medicinally. He wanted to study the therapeutic attributes that these locals found in cannabis. I mean, some of these people are actually making tinctures and drinks just like Bang. So this guy decided to test a lot of these theories with a broad range of experiments. First, he started off treatments with animals. And then he saw how safe and helpful it was. He moved on to actual people. He tested this theory first on animals like rats, reptiles, and even livestock. And he saw how safe it was for these animals that he actually even went on to trying these on humans. He studied the effects of cannabis on diseases like hydrophobia, rabies, and infant convulsion. Eventually taking all his research and presenting it to the Medical and Physical Society of Calcutta in 1839. The, raw, the results show that cannabis wasn't a cure-all for all diseases. Today, we know that medical patients use cannabis to alleviate spasms associated with things like dystonia, motor neuron disease, even multiple sclerosis. It has become an acceptable medical treatment in conditions like epilepsy and used for anesthetic and severe pain relief. Upon returning from India, making his way back home to England, he introduced the good stuff to the Pharmaceutical Society and Cannabis Indica for the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew. Based on his suggestion, Queen Victoria actually took cannabis to alleviate any menstrual aches that she had. James Mill described O'Shaughnessy's description of cannabis as the most comprehensive assessment of the properties of cannabis. After having done all these great things for cannabis, he disappeared. No one really knew what he did before he died in 1889. No matter what he did before he died, his reputation as a scholar and an inventor will long outlive him. He had such a profound impact on the world of cannabis because of his ability to scientifically look at things and his incredible intelligence. In fact, many people call him the grandfather of medical cannabis research. That was Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you guys subscribe. Follow the Long Beach Collective Association. We're doing a lot of big things in Long Beach. And follow me, at Eddie F. Diaz, and we'll see you on the next High History.